Hello and welcome to How to Be a DM. I am here with a very special guest, Mr. Chris Lindsay, product manager for Dungeons and Dragons and former Dungeon Master for me. How are you, Chris? I'm good. Tell me. I'm great. Those days of of being my dungeon master, those were some of the best days of your life. life, They were were (laughs) not bad. (laughs) I'll take that. Coming from you, I will take that. (laughs) I have fond memories of those games, yes. I have fond (laughs) memories, too. Those were the days. Well, you're an excellent dungeon master, which is why I thought of you for this, what I think is a very difficult uh, topic. And sure. um, something that I think probably a lot of, of inexperienced dungeon masters might be intimidated by, and that is how to balance encounters. Now, when I hear okay. that, the first thing I think of is math. Sure. So I don't like it already, uh, but no. I know it's important. What do you mean, no? 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 Uh, well, no, no. I, I mean, I, I understand how you might immediately like default to, and now we have to do some kind of math in order to make an encounter work. But in in some cases that might be true, but in most cases it's not. It really depends on what you started with to begin with. So if you if you had an encounter to start with, okay. right, um, you know, it could be as easy as subtracting a monster or adding a monster, right? You know, I think what's probably a good place to start is – what does it mean to balance an encounter? Like, what, what is that? When like people talk about it, but really, what does it mean? Okay, this, yeah, let's start from the beginning. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's the thing. When you have an encounter that you're going to run for your players, um, as a dungeon master, uh, you want to have a an outcome in mind uh, when you go to run the encounter. So if... The outcome is that they're going to do very well. um, Then that should always be in the back of your mind as you're as you're create crafting the encounter, and then as you're running the encounter. Um, And and by the way, this is the same for um, all three pillars of the game. So it, it doesn't. We don't have to just talk about combat encounters, although combat encounters are what a lot of people seem to focus on because they can be very math heavy and intimidating. Um, however, um, it's just as true for a social encounter or an exploration encounter. You you want to ask yourself as a dungeon master, what you hope, where you hope the players are going to, or the characters are going to be at the end of the encounter. And then the balance is basically dictated by that. So, for example, if the player characters are attacked by a band of gnolls and your goal is to just introduce them to this really vicious tribe of gnolls, but nothing else, you know, um, you would craft the encounter in such a way that the player characters would s- probably succeed unless something went horribly wrong for them somehow, okay? Um if if your goal was that the characters are going to be captured by the gnolls, then you are going to balance this encounter more differently. You're going to attempt to overwhelm the characters in a way that makes that possible um, and still uh, uh, and still kind of convey that idea that this this is this was meant to happen, not necessarily meant to happen, but this 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 could have gone differently depending on how the dice went, right? So one of the things that we always have to remember is that we have this funny thing called a D20, Mm -hmm. and it is a very swingy polyhedron, right? Uh, Since it's broken in increments of 5% from 1 to 20, um, an encounter can go a lot of different ways just based on how people are rolling. And when you get a string of really good rolls as players, um, you can turn an encounter, an encounter that was supposed to go very poorly for you based on what the dungeon master had designed to an encounter that um, you completely just walk over, right? And vice versa, if the dungeon master gets a string of really sweet rolls and they keep them, um, it could go badly for the player characters. So yeah. balance is just 
one of these things where you are, as a dungeon master, you have to know where you want to go and kind of stay focused on that and then pay attention to the game as it's unfolding. So is there like a f- formula? Like how, okay, so I don't know. I, I, it's like one of those things like, I don't know what I don't know. But you, when I ask you this question, you have to answer it like you're talking to an adult who doesn't understand second grade math. That's fine. Because I I don't understand second grade math, oh, but okay. that is not my fault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's this new way that they're doing it. Kids these days and their number lines. Um, but is there, like, if you have five players, say they're fifth level. Oh, my God, it, it's starting off like a second grade math problem. I already hate it. There's five yeah. players and they're all fifth level. And you don't want them to die, but you want sure. them to be challenged. Yes. So first of all, are your do the monsters they fight? Are they like? How do I level them up? Like what? What is there okay, like an equivalent so, so of? The monsters don't have levels; they have challenge ratings. Yeah. So how do you match that? Uh, and so um, you want to? There's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, now, because I treat our books more like encyclopedic references mm-hmm. um, i don't have like all the little tables and stuff memorized i, I can i can pull a book <laughs> that out that surprises me it, right? but okay um so the of the two books i'll show you we have we have the dungeon master's guide which yeah. showed off how to do this first right and then the next uh reference we have to use is xanathar's guide to everything okay between these two references this one is easier to use okay um, because um, uh, the the designers in their work saw that this was a little on the complicated side, and they created a series of tables that that like really breaks it down for you. Okay. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my old man glasses here for a second, and I'm okay. gonna take a look really quick, and I'll show you. Okay. Um, so if we're looking in the section here for crafting. An encounter. We are going to do this on the fly. We are. We're going to just <laughs> we're going to just break this out, and we're gonna we're gonna do math here. All right. Um, I want to say we're doing it live, but we're we're kind of recorded, so yep. that's okay. Um, so uh, crafting encounters. Um, and you're you're in Xanathar's guide, not the DMG. I am in Xanathar's guide to everything. Okay. So, for example, you said, what happens if I have fifth level characters, five mm-hmm. fifth level characters, right? Yep. So it shows you right here. Um, here is a table that goes up to fifth level for characters, right? Okay. And then as you go across, it will tell you how many monsters of any given challenge rating you could use for a regular encounter. So I can choose you any just, of those or yeah. so for mix example, and match them? If you have five fifth level characters, and by the way, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that all of the math in this book, conveniently enough, is based on a, a party of five characters. Oh, all um, right. Good to know. Um, so things change a little bit. Uh, but, uh, oh, no, 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 this is per character. So okay. if you have a fifth level character, you could have uh, two CR1 monsters, right? Okay, that's it? Because I feel like they would take them For down. One, one fifth level character. Oh, per character. Yeah, so then now, now you have five fifth level characters, and you can have, I don't know, anywhere from, I, I'm going to give you a range because... I don't like to just go directly with the numbers, maybe somewhere from six to 10 CR1 monsters, depending on how hard you want this to be, right? Well, I guess, could you keep some in your back pocket? Like you could put out seven and then they're like, if they just blow through those seven, you can be like, okay, well, here's three more. <laughs> just happen to have. A little secret of mine, maybe it's not so secret, is uh, I like environments where things can hide behind other things because sometimes there are additional monsters behind those things and sometimes there are not. Okay, so all right, so it's a good uh, maybe a good rule of thumb is like start with what you think is going to work. I I like to start low, and then if my monsters need backup, 
I might give them a little backup. Like okay. Give them a, three or four more knolls or whatever, or a couple more knolls, whatever the case may so be. do you mix and match your monsters or do you like, is it always like, I'm going to have seven knolls? Um, no, I mix and match them. Like, okay. it, it, like for example, in, in that, that same knoll encounter, I might put in like, to begin with, I might put in four or five knolls and then each one of them has like a hyena with them, like a little pet hyena. Okay. That's not as, not as dangerous, but right. And if uh, I wanted to, goose the encounter a little bit, I might have like one more knoll come in with like five more hyenas. Oh, okay. Okay. Right? I guess. And then if things were starting to go real south, maybe, and there was three hyena, hyenas left, you could make them run away. Like you're the there, dungeon master. Like you can. There, there, there is a, there is a, a point in any given encounter, particularly I think with, you know, monsters that are even quasi intelligent where they start to realize that their life is in danger okay. and that they need to break this off and that maybe they had made a poor life decision in attacking these adventurers. So okay. they would definitely uh, at some point be like, okay, I'm out. Now that doesn't mean that the, the characters, as we all know players, PC stands for plot corruptor and players will be like, no, <laughs> I'm going to cut them down before they get away. Um, and that could happen. But the, the monsters will make every effort to get out of there sometimes. So, uh, you said that these I could have one to, or I forgot. Now I forgot the numbers. But a, a monsters that had a challenge, challenge rating of one. Yeah, it was it was two challenge rating one monsters, right? Yeah, for one for one fifth level character. For one fifth level character. So yeah, like the challenge rating and the level are not they are not equal. No, no, okay. no, no, no. The I math think... doesn't work that way. Uh, okay, I think that's... In, in the. Yeah, that was the part fifth of the character up. would have a reasonable chance of survival at that point. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So when people balance encounters on the fly, like depending on what's actually happening in the game, it's really a matter of adding and dropping monsters. It is if you're if you're talking about a encounter where you have multiple creatures in it. Okay. Right now, the tougher encounter. What do you do when you have one monster? And that monster is rocking your party because they're a solo monster and maybe they're legendary. And oh no. Right. Oh yeah. Wait, yeah. How what if you just want one monster? It's yeah. not just gonna be a challenge rating of one. No, no, so how do you, no. Oh, okay. then it's so a much bigger critter. So different rules for like a multiple monsters versus a solo Yeah, like monster. like now now here's how the math does play out kind of the same, right? So if you had your four to five fifth level characters and one CR5 monster can okay. be, you would have a reasonable chance of success as players. Okay. Right? Now you don't have to have just one CR5 monster. You could have two or you could have one CR7 monster and it just gets harder. Okay. Well, how do you know? Right. Is there a, a chart for this too? Yeah, it's all in Xanathar's right here. Okay, so there is like specific rule. Like if you're if they are just coming up against one monster, yeah. this is it there's, tells a, there's you. a chart specifically for the solo monster encounter. Okay, all right. Well, then it's not okay. Easy. It's not terribly challenging. Now, when you look at the Dungeon Master's Guide, if you if you really are if you are a person, for those of you out there who love math, if you like to do math and you want to get down into the fiddly bits, you can mm -hmm. go into the Dungeon Master's Guide and it will break it down to you by basically the XP value of oh. the monster and a bunch of other factors that are in there. Um, and if you want a uh, interview where a lot of math is done, you should have got Jeremy Crawford because I'm not your guy. So is this like the uh, XP threshold and stuff like that? That I, yeah. I looked up in the DMG and I was like, no, just too you, much, shut it. You have to know order of operations in order to do those encounters. Okay. Remember order of operations from like you know middle school? Yeah, I'm having some PTSD right now. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Okay, so I think maybe for would you recommend for a new or less experienced dungeon master maybe just use the table, just go by the tables that are in the book. Yeah, if you have a copy of Xanathar's, it can be a blessing. Go by the tables in Xanathar's. It's very simple. If you want to see an example of how that might be used in a written adventure, yeah. Um. If you look at, there are three adventures. They are available um, digitally only, I believe, on uh, 
on uh, D&D Beyond, and I think they're available on Fantasy Grounds and Roll20. Um, and uh, the first one is called Stormlord's Wrath, and the second one is called The Sleeping Dragon's Wake, and the third one is called Divine Contention. And these were created to immediately follow the adventure that was in um, the Essentials Kit, right? So those encounters are specifically written out to, um, uh, to use Xanathars. So for example, oh. if, if there is like, if there were an encounter with gnolls and hyenas, it would say, okay, for every character in the party, use one gnoll and um, two hyenas, or use three hyenas and one gnoll for every other character in the party, rounded down. Right. And it just oh. gives you a very simple formula and then you do it. Right. So, so say you have five members in the party yep. that gives you two gnolls and like 15 hyenas. Oh, because you round down. You, okay. Yeah. 15 hyenas. Oh my God. Okay. And then all those pesky hyenas. And you don't have to do any more on if everything's just going as planned, then you just ride it out. There's no need to like yep. make someone run away or add another hyena. Okay. So exactly. It, That's I, just in crafting the encounter. I don't know why, but I feel like a good way to practice is just with one encounter for, and willing participants. Just because, like, for, for me, I'm not really scared of the role play. I'm not really scared of like the story part. It's the it's the encounter stuff that that scares me because it's like there's stuff happening. It's happening fast, and I have to like you know manage. 15 hyenas, but also, you know, I, I, make sure that it, it's balanced and going smoothly. I, I want, I just wanted to practice, like say, say Bart and Quinn, they're a party of two and I'm going to just yeah, practice you, you running can, an encounter. Is this a good idea? Because I just feel like. Yeah, no, if you want to practice running a combat encounter with Bart and Quinn, uh, you could do that. Quinn will win. And why will he Bart win? will just skate through. I don't know because he. You think I'm that kind of parent that I'm just going to let my kid win? No, because he beats you at uh, Dungeon Mayhem all the time. Oh, well, that's true. <laughs> oh, yeah. If we're actually going to talk about like hit skills here, then yeah. He'll win. <laughs> <laughs> and that is why I'm not the type of parent that lets him win because I don't have to. No, no. He just you don't does. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a great. That's a good way to to to, to test out some encounters, right? Um, yeah, that's probably. Is that how you play test them? Test them. Exactly how, how you play oh, test them. Oh, well, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, that is exactly what that is. So when we write an adventure and we get together, we play it, and we're play testing it. You know, as a dungeon master, I might be making adjustments during the play test to the encounters as we're going along. Um, uh, and I might verbalize those to the players or not. But I'll be making notes going, okay, so definitely five of these is way too many. I only okay. use three and they're already like, you know, sucking wind. <laughs> so um, I would totally, you know, make those notes to myself as I'm going through and in running the encounter. Um, sometimes more challenging uh, encounters. And I some people find these more um, accessible. Like you were saying, you're really good at role-playing encounters. But... Like oh, I, I didn't say that. Plane, I, I just said I was less scared of that. Less I, scared of I didn't them? say I was good at that. There's no math. But the, the thing right. is, is that when you're running a role-playing encounter, like ahead of time, I might jot down, well, here are some possible questions the characters might ask. Then during a play test, when they actually ask a question, I will write that question down and then write down my answer to the question and then tell them the answer. Oh, Okay in the role play because they'll come up with questions that I didn't think of. Oh, okay. Interesting. Right? And we, we can manage that role play interaction and we'll have more options for the dungeon master. Now, still, once you start adding more and more groups and players and stuff out there, there will still be more questions. And it's always good to put that note in there that yeah. says, if you're running this and it isn't answered here, you're going to have to use some of the information available in the adventure and kind of extrapolate or the NPC could lie. And that's also possible. <laughs> nice. Okay. I like that. Is there not only players use deception? That's true. That's true. Um, is there a good amount of time 
to sh- like how long should a, a combat encounter last? Is there like a good rule of thumb there? Is it ever like, oh my god, this is going on way too long? Clearly, I've unbalanced this. Or is uh, it no, just- generally, if you want to look at math uh, again, and you don't have to do any math, I can just tell you this this rule of thumb, and it's pretty much true for how they design the game. Uh, your your average encounter um, lasts about three rounds. An average encounter lasts about three rounds. Okay. Yeah, yeah, more or less. It could go. It could go four. Right? It might go two if the, somebody gets a surprise jump on somebody or something. Um, now, when you start talking about things like legendary monsters, that will probably ratchet up the number of rounds you run in an encounter. Um, so, or not legendary, epic. Sorry, I, I'm I. For some reason, I'm default to the legendary mythic creatures that they put in uh, in Theros, which to me are like the most awesome penultimate cool ass creatures ever made because each one is worth two uh, legendary monsters. And uh, yeah. Oh my God. There you have it. They're awesome. Uh, okay. So if, if the, the table tells me, let's go back to the, the monsters and it says you get yeah. to have um, two CR one monsters per person or per yeah. player. Right. So then yeah. I just go through the books and just choose what monsters I want that yeah. are CR1? Yep. Any ones I want? Uh-huh. Because that sounds fun. Yep. Now you're shopping. Yeah. That's what it feels like. Uh-huh. So I just go monster shopping. I know what I have to spend. I have 10 CR1s to spend. Okay. And- you got any tricks of the trade for that? Like, uh, is it like, do you prefer? I know you like a little bit of variety, but like, is it better to have like five and five it, it, of the same or it doesn't matter? It's just dealers. It really choice. depends on this, on the story I'm telling at the time. So. Oh, right. Story, story. That's right. Yeah. I keep thinking of this in the context of like, I'm just going to run encounters. It's just going to be encounters all day, every day. But yes. Okay. So I guess the story part would be dependent, but otherwise it really doesn't matter like in terms of balance that you can just you can have 10 different monsters you could yeah is that that, yeah no 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 players want some degree of immersion and stuff like that so if you want to be consistent (laughs) so you're saying now now one thing to do is keep them inside monster types that make sense to be together okay right so for example um you know, if you want to 10 CR1 creatures, if you wanted five of five ghouls mm-hmm. and like a whole bunch of zombies to go with them, that makes sense. You'll see that together. Okay. Right? Okay. Right? Do you have any recommendations for um, if you're new? Again, we're talking to an, an less experienced dungeon masters or new dungeon masters. Are there mm-hmm. monsters that are just way easier to manage than Yeah, others? usually humanoids are really easy to manage. Um, kobolds, goblins, I'm a big fan of. Okay. Um, of course, your classic uh, orc, um, gnolls, um, and then and then from there, I would go from humanoids to giants with things like ogres and trolls, not actual like cloud giants and stuff like that, but like the little ones. Your, your um, basic ones size large. Okay. So the things that look like a, a, a person, but, you know, and they generally function like a person, um, even if they're not generally right, um, you, you, can, you usually as a dungeon master have a pretty good sense of what, they, what they're like and what they would do. Okay. All right. That's good. Um, all right. So this has, been, this has been really helpful. Is there anything else that you would recommend other resources or tips or tricks for, for these new dungeon masters trying to figure out this balance thing? Um, all I'm going to say is, is try whatever comes into your mind. Be creative and, um, uh, and forgive yourself if you do something that might accidentally kill off all the player characters um, and totally forgive yourself if you let them run over the encounter. Um, never yeah. tell them that you goofed <laughs> because the dungeon master does not make a mistake. You may, you may have done something that had an 
a repercussion that you did not intend, but they don't need to know that. Right. So, so dungeon masters, in my not so humble opinion, are flawless as long as you keep it all behind the screen. All right. So there you go. I like it. That's cool. Okay. Um, have you ever, have you, I can't remember if you've ever killed any of my characters, but you've probably hurt them very badly. At least once or twice. Did you feel bad about that? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and with Not that, a bit. we <laughs> will end this interview now. Um, thank you so much, Chris. Um, thank you. This has been super helpful. And I yeah. think I'm going to like uh, go look up some tables and start throwing some monsters at my family. See what happens. Cool. I'm going to go talk to Jeremy. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm a meeting with Jeremy. Talk All to right. you later. Thanks, bud. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.